Breaking tonight, President-elect Donald Trump getting serious blowback from some of his strongest supporters as he backs down on his promise to pursue criminal charges against Hillary Clinton. Good evening and welcome to The Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megyn Kelly. For months on the campaign trail, Mr. Trump attacked his rival for conducting the highly classified business of the United States over a private, unsecured email server, all while she was Secretary of State. I think Hillary is very weak. I think she's pathetic. I think she should be in jail for what she did with her emails. She should be in jail. Hillary Clinton should be in jail. You know it. The FBI director knows it. Everybody else knows it. She should be in jail. If I win, I am going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. <laughs> and when Mr. Trump went there, the roaring crowds at his rallies responded. We heard one phrase chanted again and again, lock her up. She should be locked up. She should. Then, hours ago, Mr. Trump seemed to walk back his pledge to try to put Hillary Clinton behind bars, telling the New York Times that he does not want to, quote, hurt the Clintons and that he prefers to move on. In moments, we'll be joined by Wisconsin Congressman Sean Duffy, who was one of Mr. Trump's earliest supporters. And we'll also speak to author Peter Schweitzer, whose book, is credited with sparking the ongoing FBI investigation into the multi-billion dollar Clinton Foundation. But first, Trace Gallagher is live with the latest on all of this. Hey, Trace. Megan, right after the election, Donald Trump was even signaling that he was softening his stance on whether he would push to further investigate his former rival, telling our sister publication, The Wall Street Journal, that he hadn't, hadn't given it a lot of thought and instead wanted to focus on health care, jobs, immigration, and tax reform. And today, the president-elect confirmed it, telling The New York Times, quote, my inclination would be for whatever power I have on the matter is to say, let's go forward. This has been looked at for so long, ad nauseum. And the part where he says whatever power I have on the matter is interesting considering that those who disagree with him for not going after Clinton are seizing on just that. Conservative commentator Ann Coulter tweeting, quote, did we make him the FBI and DOJ? His job is to pick those guys, not to do their jobs. Breitbart, formerly run by Trump's chief strategist Steve Bannon, ran a headline saying, broken promise. And the conservative group Judicial Watch, which sued to get more of Hillary Clinton's State Department emails, said Trump's refusal to investigate Clinton, quote, would be a betrayal of his promise to the American people to drain the swamp of out-of-control corruption in Washington, D.C. But Rudy Giuliani, who's being considered for a cabinet position and who also said Clinton belonged in jail, is now backing off his position. Watch. Look, there's a tradition in American politics that after you win an election, you sort of put things behind you. And if that's the decision he reached, that's perfectly consistent with sort of a historical pattern. And while it might be a political tradition to put things behind you after an election, it would also be highly unusual for a president to request that the FBI close an inquiry or investigation. Megan. Unprecedented. Trace, thank you. Here now to give us both sides of this issue, Congressman Sean Duffy and Peter Schweitzer. He's the president of the Government Accountability Institute and author of Clinton Cash. Peter is the untold story of how and why foreign governments and businesses helped make Bill and Hillary rich. We begin tonight with Mr. Schweitzer. Peter, good to see you tonight. So your reaction Thank when you, you heard President-elect Trump say that? Uh, I think it's deeply disturbing. Uh, look, he shouldn't be talking about this at all. It's not his job. Uh, I was on your program earlier this year, Megan, talking about how inappropriate it would be for President Obama to intervene in an investigation. It is equally inappropriate for a president-elect and later President Donald Trump to do the same. If he wants to pardon her at the tail end of an investigation, if the Department of Justice decides that they're not going to prosecute, they are fine to do that. But the FBI is undergoing an investigation now and the president elect should not be telling them to halt their investigation. I mean the the outrage that we would have seen from conservatives and Republicans and Trump supporters if President Obama had come out 
and said explicitly, we need to move on and there should be no more investigation, and the Clinton Foundation has done good work, and we really just need to move forward. You know, the Republicans would be hammering him on overstepping yeah. his role. Yeah, that's exactly right. It is overstepping a role. And think about this, Megan. 75% of the American people believe that the elites in this country don't have to abide by the same laws as the rest of us. Play this through for a second. If Hillary Clinton had won in November, I think it's safe to assume that she would not have been investigated for the Clinton Foundation. She has lost in November, and now it seems that Donald Trump does not want her to be investigated for the Clinton Foundation. That is the definition of a rigged system. Them. Win or lose, she's not going to face any legal investigation. It just does not make sense. And one of the reasons I think Donald Trump won in certain uh, parts of the country is precisely because people felt like the elite in this country are above the law. And by him making these statements, he seems to be implying uh, that he thinks the Clintons should not have to answer or be investigated for what they've done. That's the thing, is either she's committed a crime or she hasn't. And the FBI is investigating yeah. it. And Donald Trump has come out and said, well, he, he doesn't want to hurt the Clintons. He says he's not taking investigations off the table, <laughs> but he doesn't want to hurt them. He wants to move on and move forward, which, of course, will be applauded by many Americans as a political matter. But as a legal matter, the question is whether is it is appropriate, as Ann Coulter, who is a smart lawyer, she's controversial, she's a smart lawyer, seized upon immediately. No, you're exactly right. And look, when is the idea of national unity and truth seeking, when are those two viewed as inconsistent? What I've said all along, and I think what a lot of people agree on is, let's investigate. Let's find out what we can actually discover about what the Clintons did. Maybe it can be prosecuted, maybe it can't. But, but here's the bottom line. This is a, not just about the Clintons. We need to find out what happened so we can't allow these sorts of things to happen okay, in the future. Okay, but last question, Peter, Why? last question, last question. You yeah. know, you know a lot of people, Rush Limbaugh among them, say, we never believed that. We never believed Donald Trump when he said that in the first place. That was just bluster. And now he's just admitting <laughs> that it was bluster and it was nonsense. And it was, you know, it's not exactly a broken campaign promise so much as a promise that was never really made because his heart wasn't in it. Well, you know, I can't speak for what's in uh, what's in Donald Trump's head. I can say that my view, and I think of the view of a lot of people in the FBI, five field offices investigating the Clinton Foundation, it was not bluster, and it was not about throwing Hillary Clinton in jail. It was about investigating possible criminal activity, and that needs to go forward. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, Peter. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Megan. Joining me now with more, Congressman Sean Duffy, who is one of President-elect Trump's earliest supporters. Congressman, good to see you. So what do you make of Peter's argument? First of all, I got to tell you, I love Peter. He's a patriot, and I'm a big fan of all of his work, which allowed uh, Donald Trump to publicly prosecute this case. But I, I think he's mixing up the argument. Donald Trump was talking about the private server and the emails, uh, and Director Comey did an investigation. Loretta Lynch decided not to prosecute. I think what Donald is saying is that's behind us. Let's move forward. Uh, we don't Based on what? Where, where, do you get that, where do you get that he was taking the Clinton Foundation off the table? Because he said um, that people could argue the Clinton Foundation has done good work, which is a very different message than the one we heard from him a couple months ago. But, but I do think on the, in, in regard to his public statements and, and his fans chanting lock him up, that was in regard to the emails and the private server. Uh, the investigation hasn't been completed yet with regard to the Clinton Foundation, and I think that should go, should go forward. But, Megan, I think what's important to But it's not about what you think. Donald it's about Trump what President-elect elect Trump thinks. And he did not make that distinction today. It sounded like either way, he believes Hillary Clinton, as he put it, uh, that she's, she's had enough pain. That's what Kellyanne said on his behalf, and that he doesn't want to hurt her. Well. Well, I, I would disagree then. I do think the investigation should go forward. But can I make another point, Megan? Sure. I think what's important for Donald Trump is if you look back and you blow your political capital prosecuting and going after Hillary Clinton, as opposed to saying, how do I actually make America great again? How do I fight for the forgotten men and women and families and communities who crossed political lines and voted for me or who haven't voted for 20 years but came out to support my campaign because he was going to fight for policies that were going to make my life better? Um, my family better. They're going to put a chicken in all of our pots. 
That's what America, I think, wants him to fight for. And if you look back and burn political capital on Hillary, you can't move forward with securing the border or tax reform but that, listen, uh, or that, health care reform. I get and, that. And by the way, I get that. Right. A lot of Americans out there are sitting yeah. listening to you agreeing with that. But that is a very different message from the one Trump sounded when he was running for this office. And for that matter, very different message from the one sounded by yourself at, at Donald Trump campaign events, including this one on August 16th. Watch. We have to elect Donald Trump to do that. We have to elect Donald Trump to lock her up. And now it's like, for the That's good right. of the country, we have to move forward. I mean, do you know, do you understand how people watch this and they're like, lying politicians who just say anything to get right. elected. They think we're chumps, that we're going to believe them then, and now we're supposed to believe them again now, even though the two messages but appear no. to be diametrically opposed. But, Megan, you have to look and say the, the, the lock her up chant and Donald Trump were specifically talking about the email server um, and, and the emails themselves and secure information on a private server. Comey came out with his statements after that little rally that we had in Wisconsin, which, by the way, was really fun. And I, I think that's been put behind us. Do you, do you want to have Donald but when, when Trump Comey to came out actually and encourage them to reopen the investigation? He reopened it. That. And then you, Team Trump made a it. huge deal out of it, and then he purported to close it, and Team Trump continued to make a huge right. deal out of it, and said the system was rigged, so, and, and, di and disagreed with Comey's decision, and wanted so, but, her put in but, jail. But you as a lawyer, Megan, and me as a former prosecutor, do I want Donald Trump to then say, no, 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 I am going to be... Um, the FBI had, and I'm going to head the, the Department of Justice, you and I'm going to force them to did. reopen Team an Trump investigation. Did. That Team they Trump did. closed. The lawyers who happen, no. some of whom happen to be anchors, actually said, "We accept the FBI's decision. They've made it clear." But you guys were the ones saying, "Lock her uh, up." No, and no. now tonight, it's a 180. I, we're supposed to pretend the magic of me, videotape does no. not exist. Megan, I, I actually agreed that listen, I was going to take Comey at his word because I didn't have all the evidence. I didn't sit inside the FBI. So uh, I publicly was out there saying whatever Comey decides, I think we have to go with. Okay, um, but your but candidate you know, those, did not feel that way. And now he's the president-elect, you see? So, I mean, it, there's, you understand the frustration of some of Mr. Trump's supporters I, and the frustration of just do, reasonable people who see... And I'll but, give you the last but word. Megan, you do want you you want him to fight for the policies that are going to help the economy of middle America that elected him. And you can't do that if you have a political fight with Hillary Clinton. Let's move forward and start making America great, which isn't putting Hillary Clinton in jail right now. Great to see you, Congressman. Thanks for being here. You too, Megan. So also tonight, new questions about whether intense media coverage. I mean, and it has been intense of a white nationalist meeting in Washington. The thing had it had like 285 people, disturbing, but does it justify the amount of wall-to-wall -wall coverage that we have seen of this group and the repeated demands to have Donald Trump denounce this ugly group, which he's done, but they want it done in stronger terms and so on and so forth. We'll have reaction on that from former Intel Committee Chairman Pete Hoekstra and Democratic strategist Robert Zimmerman. Plus, the president-elect goes face-to-face -face with the New York Times in a meeting that made headlines on waterboarding peace in the Middle East, and Mr. Trump's relationship with President Obama. Howie Kurtz and Mike Huckabee are next with the news. They are so dishonest, folks. You can't even read articles in certain papers anymore. New York Times is a total lie. Developing tonight, new fallout. After 48 hours of intense media coverage for the annual conference of a white nationalist organization. Video surfaced over the weekend from a Washington meeting of roughly 275, 85 people at the conference, some of whom are caught on tape making Nazi salutes and praising President-elect Donald Trump. While Mr. Trump has been called on several times to disavow the tape and the group, which he has done, there are growing questions tonight about whether all the media coverage is giving this group exactly what it wants. Trace Gallagher is in our West Coast newsroom with more. Trace? Megan, the controversial video showing a few hundred members of alt-right movement praising Donald Trump and raising their hands in a Nazi-type salute was posted by Atlantic Magazine, which is doing a documentary on Richard Spencer, who is the man, now the primary face of the alt or alternative right movement. We're not showing the video or putting up Spencer's racist, anti-Semitic remarks because it's become apparent that Richard Spencer, who is well-educated and from an affluent family, is reveling in the national coverage and reportedly using it to 
to promote and recruit. For example, this weekend's alt-right gathering in D.C. was attended by fewer than 300 members and covered by between 50 and 75 journalists and photographers. Before latching on to the Donald Trump campaign, alt-right, which has been around for about eight years, mostly operated from the fringes of the Internet. Donald Trump has now disavowed the alt-right, telling the New York Times, quoting here, it's not a group I want to energize, and if they are energized, I want to look into it and find out why. Critics say the group was partially energized by Trump's new chief strategist, Steve Bannon, who formerly ran Breitbart and told Mother Jones magazine that Breitbart was the platform of the alt-right though Bannon says he strongly rejects the anti-Semitic and racist elements of the group. And Donald Trump has defended Bannon, saying, quote, I've known Steve Bannon a long time, and if I thought he was a racist of alt-right, I wouldn't even think about hiring him. We should note there are no estimates on how many alt-right members there are because the group has no formal structure. Mm -hmm. Megan. Trace, thank you. Joining me now, former Michigan Congressman Pete Hoekstra who's an advisor to Donald Trump's transition team, and Robert Zimmerman, Democratic strategist and DNC committee member. Now look, unlike these other channels, we are not gonna wallpaper this show with this guy from the white nationalist group. I'm gonna show one very short clip of what he was doing, which has been so controversial, and it went on and on and on. Viewers be advised, it's hateful and disgusting in all the things you think it's gonna be. Watch. Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! Making the Nazi salute and went on to say, Hail, uh, let's party like it's 1933. Robert, you want to set this up for us? Why? I mean, everyone understands the hatefulness of the group, but why is it on Donald Trump? Well, it's on Donald Trump, and it's Donald Trump's responsibility as our president-elect, because since Election Day, uh, we have seen, according to the Anti-Defamation League, a record, high, record rise in hate crimes, especially amongst young people, using the language from the Trump campaign. And because at the same time Donald Trump says, to Steve, says that he would never hire Steve Bannon if Bannon was from alt-right, Bannon acknowledged that he made uh, Breitbart the platform for the alt-right or the white supremacist movement. That the is, he did say that to Mother Jones. He's since denied it. But the thing is, but, Robert, and I'm going to get to Congressman Hoekstra in a second, but the thing is, you know, how is Donald Trump responsible for the, the hateful rhetoric of a group that likes him? Let's, let's be very clear. According to Speaker Paul Ryan, Donald Trump engaged in racist rhetoric in the campaign. Of course, the birther lie contributed to the racist, the racist climate in the campaign as well. So the point simply here is Donald Trump is our president-elect has a responsibility to unite the country and bring it together. It shouldn't be when he speaks to the New York Times editorial board with the same energy he used on Twitter to condemn Alec Baldwin on Saturday Night Live or condemn the cast of Hamilton. But the thing he is, should be using his energy okay, to condemn, he should be using his energy to condemn the extremist bigotry that it. we're witnessing in the hate crimes. But the crimes. thing is, Mr. Hoekstra, so he's come out, Donald Trump has said, and I, he said, I disavow them, I condemn them, I want nothing to do with them. Um, but, but He's saying he doesn't want to call more attention to them. And honestly, to see the wall-to-wall -wall coverage we've seen of this some places, you would think that, they're, that instead of 285 of them in a restaurant, we're talking about 285,000. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a fringe group that's looking for attention. They want to be on the Kelly file. They want to be on these shows wall-to-wall. -wall. Well, that, that's exactly right. And they've played the media beautifully. And, you know, they... Working, they're working with a willing accomplice. These folks want to destroy Donald Trump. They've gone after Bannon. They've gone after Pete Sessions. They've gone after Michael Flynn. Uh, you know, they're not giving this president a break at all. The clear thing here is Donald Trump has disavowed this group, uh, and he is moving forward, and he's talking about what he's going to do to make but America Robert's better point for, is, for all point, Americans. Robert's point is that he needs to more forcefully come out and condemn them. We've seen this elsewhere. Too. This is um, one example from the Anti-Defamation League sure. saying uh, he should be doing more to discredit these people. Another, uh, an, another, uh, yeah, same guy came out and said he has to clearly state these are not American values, that their ideology is in conflict with American values. That's what we depend on our president to do to set, set these people straight. And the more Donald Trump talks about it, the more that he's talking about issues that are not going to move America forward. These are the same people that were saying, you know, the Muslim community, 
uh, is in fear of Donald Trump. They are stoking these fears. And what happens on Election Day? Sure, Donald Trump doesn't get that many Muslim votes, but he gets three times more the number of Muslim votes than what Mitt Romney got. Why? Because there are a number of Muslims who are very serious and seriously concerned about ISIS, and they're finally glad that we're going to have a president that is going to take on ISIS. Why? Because ISIS is killing more moderate Muslims around yeah. the world, and they're glad that we have a president who will focus so let me on ask that. You, Robert, this what do is you think? a media storm that's a fake story. All right, let's talk about the media storm for a second, because uh, Sean Spicer, who's the deputy over there at the Republican National Convention, was on with uh, our friend Wolf Blitzer on CNN today, and this happened. Watch. All right. Should he no, go I, I out there and, and deliver a specific speech and make that abundantly clear? He doesn't want these people support, and he condemns them. When is it going to be enough? He has condemned everyone that's come out and supported him, every group that supported him. At some point, you've got to take you know his position and, and go move on. Why doesn't he do that? more dramatically, if you will, and make it clear he wants no part of these people. Because I think it's asked and answered, Wolf. You've asked me eight, quiet, eight times the same question. I've told you what his position is. What exactly does Donald Trump need to do to satisfy, you know, the, the folks who are paying attention to this group? You know, what Donald Trump needs to do, in my estimation, and he's in a very unique role to really unite the country as the congressman reference is to speak to the American people, to address the issue of race and prejudice in our society. And what better time than during the Thanksgiving holiday season? Because he, is in a, he has an opportunity here. It's to speak not just to those neo-Nazis that we witnessed, but let's remember the record rise of hate crimes throughout our country. It's not a fake crisis when a swastika is paint, painted paint on a wall of a, of a home in a neighborhood, or where Muslims or the gay community, or in fact the black community are feeling frightened or, or dealing with actual yeah. epitaphs thrown at them. He has to talk about the fact that how he's going to bring our country together. We're not going to solve this problem by ignoring it. Okay. That just gives fuel Understood. to the opposition. For whatever it's worth, the white nationalist defends his Nazi salute as a rhetorical flourish, said there was a lot of cheekiness going on and exuberance because Mr. Trump's win had lifted their spirits of their radical movement. So there you have it, all sides, uh, including that of the white nationalist group, something you never thought you'd say on national TV. Great to see you both. Good Thanks, to be guys. with you. Breaking tonight, Fox News confirming that President-elect Donald Trump has offered Dr. Ben Carson the top spot at housing and urban development. Dr. Carson says he wants to take the holiday to think it over, after earlier suggesting he wasn't interested in a cabinet position in the Trump administration. He's scheduled to join us on this broadcast tomorrow night. Maybe we'll force an answer out of him. Mm -hmm. Don't miss that. The news comes on the same day that Mr. Trump went face to face with the New York Times over how the paper is covering and has been covering the president-elect and his new administration. For more on that, we go to Fox News Media Buzz host, Howie Kurtz. Hey, Howie. Hey, Megan. Donald Trump constantly criticizes what he calls the failing New York Times and then threatened a lawsuit during the campaign. So it was something of a surprise when he agreed to a meeting today, even more of a surprise when he canceled it, tweeting that the paper had tried to change the terms and conditions and continues to cover me inaccurately and with a nasty tone. The Times says it was Trump who tried to drop the on-the-record portion of the meeting, but within hours it was back on, with publisher Arthur Sulzberger Jr. sitting next to the president-elect at the Manhattan newsroom. And Trump, who had been keeping a low profile, made plenty of news. Trump said he had changed his mind on the use of waterboarding and other forms of torture, deciding it's not effective. After talking with retired General James Mattis, who he's seriously, seriously considering to run the Pentagon. Trump dug in against taking action to resolve potential conflicts of interest involving his global real estate empire, refusing to rule out meeting business partners in the White House. And he won't distance himself from his children who will be running it. If we're up to some people, said Trump, I would never ever see my daughter Ivanka again. And speaking of family, he said he might tap Ivanka's husband, Jared Kushner, a Jewish developer and campaign advisor with no experience in public office, as a special envoy to the Middle East. Trump saying he'd love to be the one who makes peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Trump even said he has an open mind on climate change, which he has called a concept 
concept invented by the Chinese to hurt American manufacturing. In this interview, he refused to repeat his earlier position on abandoning the global climate agreement reached last year in Paris. And Trump appeared to back off his threat to loosen the libel laws, telling the Times folks, I think you'll be happy. Bottom line here, these comments will probably be welcomed by the Washington establishment, even by some Democrats, but could be seen as a betrayal by Trump's conservative base. In fact, the conservative site Breitbart, which had been run by Trump advisor Steve Bannon, ripped Trump for a broken promise for saying he's decided against seeking a special prosecutor for Hillary Clinton. The newspaper billed today's session as Trump, quote, tempered some of his most extreme campaign promises. Or maybe he's just moderating his stances as newly elected presidents sometimes do. Megan? I, I can't keep up. Howie, thank you. <laughs> Joining me now with more, Governor Mike Huckabee, former presidential candidate and Fox News contributor, and Julie Riginski, Democratic strategist and Fox News contributor. So we're no longer going to prosecute Hillary Clinton. We're reversing our position on the climate change agreement. We are no longer going to torture or waterboard, which he said at virtually all these campaign stops and in many debates, Governor. Just like how many campaign promises is that before he's even been sworn in? Oh, I don't know. You know, and sometimes I'm not sure whether Donald Trump is humoring the New York Times, uh, who has never been polite to him, never been fair or balanced with him in any way. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I think Donald Trump is uh, doing a lot of things right now to, uh, you know, give some good optics. And I, I think we'll wait till he takes the oath of office. But I do believe this, Megan, if he fundamentally changes the major positions that he campaigned on and the reason that, you know, 60 million people went and voted for him, I, I think it'll be a real rocky start because there are expectations. Do? I do. Yeah, because look, nobody... Uh, at the New York Times wants or believes Donald Trump will be a good president. Nobody at the Washington Compost believes that either. But there are millions of Americans who tore their shirts for Donald Trump and went out there and got him elected. Yeah. If he were to make major changes many, in his position, it the would campaign, be disaster. And they never held it against him. They believe in the man, if not the mission. Julie, I want to ask you about um, Jared Kushner, who, you know, is really sort of the with respect to him, boy wonder, you know, of the campaign. He's, you know, he's a, he's a business guy, uh, Ivanka's husband, who really helped get Donald Trump elected as the president. And his business credentials are really impressive. However, he, the, he, Trump, Mr. Trump is making news today by saying that Jared Kushner could help make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians and, and pushing, according to NBC News, uh, to get him a top secret clearance so that he can be privy to the presidential daily brief despite not being an official member of the White House and the cabinet. Um, your thoughts on, on, on that? Well, I think it betrays a incredible lack of seriousness and a commitment to what needs to be done with foreign policy. Look, what Jared Kushner is, I guess, what his qualifications are in Donald Trump's mind is, he's Jewish, he's been to Israel a bunch of times, me too. I mean, you know, there's a lot of us like that, but it doesn't mean that I'm qualified to be Dennis Ross or Henry Kissinger. Or, or, or George Mitchell or any of the people who are very serious diplomats who've tried to bring peace to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And to say that Jared Kushner, whose only qualification from what I can tell, are that he married into the Trump family, is somebody that can take on this very onerous responsibility, which has ramifications not just for the Middle East, but really for our foreign policy across the world, um, outside the Middle East, in addition to the Middle East, is laughable. And so for anybody to believe that he has any qualifications short of his religion and potentially having traveled, as, as a lot of people have in Israel, is, is, is again, is, is not a serious analysis of what needs to be done well, if somebody's really serious. Well, what do you make really of it, serious. Governor? Because he's a smart man. Uh, he's very loyal to Mr. Trump. He helped get him elected. Is it more of a spokesperson type position where he would just be relaying the messages of the administration and familiarity with the issues is required, but being a true diplomat may not be may not be you tell me well look i i don't think anybody expects jared kushner or anybody else is going to go and resolve this because if you want really want to know this goes back to isaac and ishmael it, right. it doesn't have a start there may be 50 limits years to ago Jared's 70 gifts. years ago <laughs> well look and here's what i want to just be very clear about there's going to be no peace in the palestinian israeli conflict until at first the palestinians get serious about it and they quit uh, telling the school children that it's a good thing to murder Jews. This has been going on since the beginning. They had a chance in 1995 when Ehud Barak almost gave away 95% of Judea and Samaria, yeah. 
and Arafat rejected the whole it's thing. It's a tall they bar. They don't want peace. It's a tall bar. I got to ask you this quickly before I let you go, Julie. Uh, on the First Amendment and Trump's commitment to it, because he's obviously had not the most respectful relationship with the tra with the press. Uh, he said to the New York Times, "He, I think you'll be happy <laughs> with respect to his First Amendment commitment." You know, it's funny because Trump, when he wants to. When he wants to charm you, he, he can do it. But the problem is the press is going to hit him. They're going to hit him right between the eyes. And, and they're not going to be happy, and he's not going to be happy with that. It's just not the nature of media covering a president. Your thoughts? Look, I mean, the media has to do their job with that fear of favor. And so if somebody says they're going to open up loose and libel laws, as Donald Trump said throughout the campaign. That's another one he just walked back. Yeah, he just walked. You listen, he'll walk it forward again tomorrow. That's the problem. You don't know where he stands. You know, we have we, we can have daily, if not hourly conversations about whiplash and what he says at any given time and any given issue. If he walked it back, I'm happy to hear it. If he consistently for the next four years decides that he's not going to pursue it, that's fantastic. But he cannot lash out at The New York Times, The Washington Post, Fox News, or anybody else when any of us say something he doesn't like. Mm -hmm. That's the reality of a free press. He, it was interesting because he said, um, if you guys see something where you feel I'm wrong, I'd love to hear it. You can call me. Arthur <laughs> Salzberger Jr., you can, you can call me. But of course, this is not how it works. Like, they're they're, they're going to call. He's going to blow them off. They're going to write pieces that he doesn't like. And I guarantee right here tonight that the, the New York Times will not be happy and Donald Trump yeah, will not be happy. No one will be happy because media coverage of a president is usually not happy. I got to go. Megan. Go ahead. One quick thing. We're talking about the credibility of Donald Trump. We need to be talking about the credibility of the New York Times, okay. which doesn't have any. We've had that discussion. They don't have any. Great to see they you have both. None. No one's hot. No one's happy. First of all, there's no happiness in media. And there's definitely no happiness in politics. And when you miss the two of them together, there's zero happiness. It's all about unhappiness and skeptical and cynical awfulness. Welcome to the Kelly file. So coming up, <laughs> Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan is now being accused of sexism for the crime of challenging Nancy Pelosi for her job as minority leader. He's here tonight to respond to that. Plus the left, some of them, thought it was great when a Broadway cast publicly challenged VP-elect Mike Pence. But how did they react when Dr. Ben Carson spoke truth to power? Back at the National Prayer Breakfast when the president was Barack Obama. Mark Thiessen and Mac Bennett are next for our little walk down memory lane. New questions tonight about a possible double standard when it comes to free speech. We heard some voices signaling their approval after the cast of Hamilton publicly confronted Vice President-elect Mike Pence following Friday's showing of the popular Broadway show. Donald Trump, if you're offended by someone actually speaking their mind and talking about the fact that there are many people in this country, minorities, the vulnerable, many people who, who have some sense of apprehension, if you have a problem with that, then that is a problem. There was a very respectful message read on stage by the cast of Hamilton. The entire show is a political message. So I'm surprised that Trump would take that tone. It's not a, a tirade from the stage. It was a, actually a respectful thank you to Mike Pence for coming to the show. Respectful. But remember back in 2013 when Dr. Ben Carson was openly critical of President Obama at the National Prayer Breakfast? We heard very different reactions back then. It was one of the more shameful appearances I've seen in Washington in, in my career. Uh, it is a, a way for people to commune with the God of their choice. And this guy turns it into a Republican talking point political session. I think it's really um, uh, not really an appropriate place to uh, make this kind of political speech um, and to invoke God as his support for that kind of, of point of view. Joining me now, Mark Thiessen, Fox News contributor and former chief speechwriter for President George W. Bush, also an AEI fellow, and Matt Bennett of Third Way. Great to see you both. So Good to see you, Megan. It's not the same people. We're just trying to make the point. And there's been hypocrisy on the right, too, for that matter, in praising Dr. Carson back in the day, but condemning the cast of Hamilton today. Uh, your take on it, Mark Thiessen. Uh, well, first of all, there's a, there's a long tradition of speaking truth to power at the National Prayer Breakfast, and it didn't start with Dr. Ben Carson. Uh, it actually, in 1994, Mother Teresa came to the National Prayer Breakfast and stood in front of Bill and Hillary Clinton and gave a powerful message against abortion. And then, you know what? She invoked God, because that's what you do at the National Prayer Breakfast. She, she stood there while... She was inappropriate, as Mother Teresa she, often was. Ma, Saint, <laughs> blessed Saint Teresa of Calcutta was not inappropriate, Megan. No. <laughs> and she, she stood there while Bill and Hillary Clinton were stone-faced and the crowd applauded and said there are no unwanted children if you don't want your children give them to me uh, and the, and, they were, and they were completely flummoxed. So, so, 
Well, what you do at the National Prayer Breakfast is a place where leaders are called to present their views and their opinions on moral questions facing the day. Hamilton is a musical on Broadway. There's paid to sing and dance and it's entertain political. us to entertain us for $850 a ticket. Now, if they want to take their show and be rude and turn it into a platform to uh, attack uh, uh, Trump and Pence, that's their prerogative, but they have to realize that they look absolutely ridiculous okay. to the rest of America ahead, when they Matt. do it. Well, look, it's tough. When Mark invokes Mother Teresa, that's a tough start for me. You gotta understand, <laughs> Megan, but, but- No good but way out. I, I will say, uh, when it comes to Barack Obama, he's been very clear that people have the right to speak their mind. If you remember when that protester was shouting at him near the end of the campaign, he hushed the crowd and told them to be respectful of the guy, and uh, particularly because he was elderly. Yeah, but you and, remember and many on the left were outraged at Ben Carson for what he yeah, did at that prayer breakfast. Same, same types of complaints we heard um, at, from the right in response to Hamilton. Yeah, there's no shortage of hypocrisy, if you point out. But look, Dr. Carson was standing at the president's podium. He was lecturing the president about policy. Mike Pence and was trying was doing, to see a Broadway show. Well, but, but Carson was doing it kind of a snide way, talking about death panels. Oh, if you look, but, but. The guy lecturing Mike Pence, our vice president-elect, has tweeted out about hoes, calling women hoes. I'm <laughs> saying. <laughs> But when he, he wasn't lecturing him, he was, I, I thought it was actually quite a respectful comment that he was making. This guy who was talking had just played a vice president on stage. I, I don't think he felt that they could Query pass up the opportunity. That, you know, he it. also slept in a Holiday Inn last night, but it doesn't necessarily make you <laughs> the person to, you know, advise the vice he, president-elect. Although, he should have. listen, I tend to like, you know, sort of these open statements from all sides because it's quintessentially American and more speech he, is, is better speech. He should have but taken Aaron Burr's advice, which is uh, th go. talk less, smile more. Okay, bye. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi's challenger next. Well, Nancy Pelosi's 14 year reign as the head of the House Democratic Caucus may be in serious jeopardy as 43 year old Ohio Representative Tim Ryan mounts a challenge to his one time mentor. He says it's nothing personal, but now he's being denounced as sexist just for throwing his hat in the ring. Joining us now, Representative Tim Ryan. Great to see you, sir. So, yes, yeah, somebody over at Think Progress says, uh, the thing where an obscure male backbencher thinks he deserves to replace the most accomplished woman in Congress is how sexism works. Your response. Well, I got a lot of respect for Nancy Pelosi. She's a historic figure, but this is not about the leader's gender. This is about the leader's record. And we are down over 60 some seats since 2010. We have the smallest Democratic uh, number in our House caucus since 1929. We're not winning. And if this was a, a football coach or a, a baseball manager, uh, we would be trading him in for someone new. And I'm asking the opportunity to, to do that myself. Do you think Nancy Pelosi resonates with Democrats in the rest in the Rust Belt and places like Ohio, where you're from? Well, the whole premise of, of me running is saying that I don't think the current leader can connect with people in the areas of the country that we need to connect in order to get back into the majority and push programs that are going to increase jobs and wages and secure pensions in, in places like uh, Youngstown, Ohio. And I think we've turned into a coastal party. We are no longer a national party, and that was proven on Tuesday night. And if we want to get back to being able to win races in the South, in the industrial Midwest, we need some new leadership, a new message, and a new agenda. They say she's got a legendary ability to unite your party. Well, I think Donald Trump does too, Megan. <laughs> so, well, we'll watch. The elections are on November 30th. They say you're a long shot. Uh, she's got a lot of power. We'll find out whether she holds on to it. Great to see you, sir. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back. Big news. My new book, Settle for More, is number one on the Barnes & Noble bestseller list. Thanks to all of you, and thank you so much for buying it. I wanted to share a few Facebook posts with you. This one from Meg Grassley, who writes, Loving your book. Can't put it down. I got so teary reading the stories about your father and the years of bullying. The particular story of the girls calling you and you then going outside to skate on the ice in the cold. Felt like I was there. On the other hand, the stories of your mom's quick and witty responses make me wish I knew her personally. Your book has given me such a different perspective watching you at 9 p.m. every night. Can't wait to keep on reading. My mom's going to love that one. <laughs> this one comes from Fred White. I could not put it down, finishing it in the wee hours of the morning. I want to thank you for sharing your life story. 
Even an old Marine found tears running down my face while reading about the loss of your beloved dad. Your book also made me do some self-reflection and soul reflection and soul searching. Thank you again. That means a lot to me. Thank you. Candace Mazingo writes, all I can say is that you've won me back over again. I needed that little pep talk about getting back up no matter who knocks you down. I've wallowed in my feelings long enough. It's been eight years, she says, and it's time to get on with life. Thank you. And plenty of uplifting messages from women, like Bethany Elfering, who writes, I feel that you are such an inspiration to young girls. You're showing them that they can be strong, empowered, respected, and can be what they put their mind to. Amen to that. Thank you all for listening and for reading, and have a wonderful Thanksgiving.